Here is chapter six of the Ballad of Lucy Whipple. <clears throat> chapter six, Autumn Winter, 1849 to 1850, in which I try to tell Mama my name, write letters, and threaten to sigh myself to death. I finally got up the courage to approach Mama about this Lucy matter. Mama, can I ask you something? Depends on what, said Mama as she poured molasses and mustard powder into the pot of beans. Will you... Um, I didn't quite know how to make Mama see that this was important to me and not to joke or snort in irritation. Spit it out, California. Mama stirred the beans once more and put them into the oven of the cook stove. That's it, Mama. California. I don't want to be called California. California is a place, not a person. I want to be called Lucy. Mama stopped in the middle of licking the molasses spoon. What are you talking about? I could feel my cheeks grow hot as the cook stove. About me, Mama. I want to be called Lucy, not California. Lucy? Where did you come up with a name like that? In a book, but it doesn't matter. A book, I should have known. That's what makes you so notional, those books. Mama, please. Mama looked at me, twisting my hands in my apron and trying hard not to cry. She sighed. After 12 years of calling you California, I don't see how I can suddenly say Lucy any more than I could Bossy or Nellie or Lady Jane. Will you try, Mama? We'll see. Now go do something useful. I straightened my apron and took a deep breath. I'll go write some letters. You will gather wood for the cook stove, beat the dust out of the bed quilts, put the sheets on to boil, rub salt and vinegar into the ink stains on your aprons and lay them in the sun and set the table for supper. Then you can write some letters, said Mama. And that was that. Dear Graham and Grandpa. Well, I told Mama about me being Lucy instead of California, and now she just calls me Missy or Chicky or Sis or nothing at all. To her, I'm not Lucy yet, but I'm not California either, and that just suits me fine. If I were the gambling sort, I'd been a petty she will call me Lucy before too long. I think she'd be embarrassed to stand outside the tent and shout, Oh, Chicky, come home and start supper. I will keep you informed. I liked writing letters. There wasn't much else to do for fun and lucky diggings if you didn't dig or drink. At first I wrote on pink writing paper, a going away gift from Aunt Beulah, but was finally reduced to using the scraps of greasy paper that came wrapped around the bacon and cheese and lard from Mr. Scatter's store. Dear Cousin Batty, do not let your father bring you here, for you would not like it and would most likely die. At the least you would get your hands dirty and mud on your pretty white shoes. I do not much like it, and I do not mind mud nearly as much as you do. It is lonely here. I even almost miss you. Regards from your cousin who now calls herself Lucy. It was a lot easier to write what I thought or felt than to say it out loud. I could write things I'd never say to someone's face, especially since I didn't quite believe those letters would ever get all the way around to Massachusetts. Snowshoe Blue, who had the biggest feet in the Sierra, carried letters to San Francisco for mailing and brought mail back for a dollar a letter. He walked up and down the mountains and valleys on a trail where there was a trail or navigating by trees and peaks or stars when there wasn't. Lucky Diggings was all in a dither each month when Snowshoe Blue showed up, bringing the promise of a letter or newspaper or a package from some faraway exotic place or even better, from home. Dear Grandma and Grandpa, if ever you write, please enclose money so I can pay Snowshoe Blue and continue to write you letters. Gold would be best, but I believe dollars would do. I am still selling a few pies, so I have been making a little money each day for my pickle crock, but most of the miners don't seem to care for pie much, preferring to spend their money on beans, whiskey, and tobacco. Mr. Scatter says all miners are vagabonds, scoundrels, and assassins, but that he's not leaving until he has enough money to burn a wet mule. The miners, on the other hand, think Mr. Scatter is the scoundrel, taking all their precious gold to pay for flour and salt. Hard as Scatter's heart is heard around here near as often as pay dirt, humbug, and more whiskey, dang it. Snowshoe Baloo was my first real friend in California. He had a sweet smile and appreciated a slice or two of pie whenever he picked up letters. I didn't even know we were friends until his third or fourth visit, when he brought me an eagle feather, for he didn't talk much. I don't know if he got used to silence because of being alone in the mountains, or if he took to the mountains because they were silent. And he never said. Dear Graham and Grandpa, Mama said that we are all fine and healthy, and if I cannot write nicer things than I usually do, I cannot write at all. 
except to hear only good things from now on, whether they are true or not. You'll begin to think Leggy Diggins is as calm as a toad in the sunshine. Snowshoe's best friend was an Indian called Hennet, which means beaver, for his thick brown hair. Jimmy Whiskers told me Snowshoe and Hennet would sit on the back big windy and sweat house for hours, cleaning themselves of all human smell, and then go hunting for deer Snowshoe used for making his shoes, his big feet being too big for ready-mates. After hunting, Jimmy said, Snowshoe and Hennet would thank the spirit of the deer for sharing his hide and meat with them. I thought it was a good idea, and for a while thanked the prairie chickens and rabbits and squirrels I shot, but it never seemed quite enough. Dear Graham and Grandpa, I dreamed last night of clam chowder and Graham's apple pan dowdy with sweet yellow cream. Woke to a bean and biscuit breakfast again. We all eat lots of beans and biscuits. Except for what I shoot, our meat is mostly the weevils and the flour, or some moldy salt pork that traveled halfway around the world to find us and did not have an easy trip. I think such a diet cannot be as healthy for little children as wholesome Massachusetts food, but when I try to talk to Mama of this, she looks like she's going to spit. If you see my former teacher, Miss Charlotte Homer of Reedsville, kindly inquire if she might send me a book. I am sick to death of Ivanhoe and Mr. Scatter's Bible, and there is not another book in these mountains. Once, when Snowshoe seemed more talkative than usual, I asked him why he took to the mountains and the mails. Snowshoe shrugged and said, No many, trust few. Always paddle your own canoe. Don't you have family? I asked. Snowshoe said he didn't recollect. Dear Graham and Grandpa, You would not know me. I am so tall and almost fat. I think it is all the biscuits and gravy. I do the biscuits, but Mama makes fine gravy. It is one reason her boarding house is full. That and the fact that the miners like to look at her, her being the only woman in the camp except for Millie, who has come to work at the saloon, and Mr. Scatter's grown daughter, Belle, who was cross-eyed and bad skin and is as mean as a meat axe. Maybe she should marry Mr. Coogan and they can go into the meanness business. Two bits of a frown, a dollar a scowl, and a twenty-dollar gold piece would buy you a flat-out savagerish rage. Mr. Scatter has hired Snooze McGrath to build an honest-to-gosh wooden boarding house behind the general store, so we are hoping to be out of this tent by winter. Mama works hard, but sees only the mountains and big trees and clear blue sky, and doesn't seem to see the dirt. I myself am knee-deep in dirt. I am getting more used to borders and even open my mouth now and then. But it seems just as if I'm just as I'm getting friendly, they leave, going home or to the city for the winter, except for Mr. Coogan, who gives every indication of becoming a permanent member of the Whipple family. We look never to get out of here. My heart is so sore with missing you and Pa and Golden and home. Sometimes I think I'll sigh myself to death. I asked Jimmy why Snowshoe kept so quiet and alone all the time. He ain't much for other people, Jimmy said. Doesn't he have any kin? Well, said Jimmy, scratching his beard with his fork. There's Hennet, though I don't suppose you'd exactly call him kin. And there was the duck. What duck? Old Snowshoe used to own a killer duck named Goliath. He would take that duck from mining camp to mining camp to fight with dogs and make a lot of money on. Seems no one would bet on a duck against a dog, but no dog could beat that duck. Except one, Jimmy sighed. Guess you'd have to say that duck was like Snowshoe's kin. Dear Uncle Matt, Aunt Beulah, and Cousin Batty, We just received the letter you sent us last summer. It was the first we've gotten here in Lucky Diggins, and what a pleasure to hear from you and know all that little Batty is doing. I am sure she deserved the spelling prize and the art medal, and we are all pulling for her to be Easter Princess, you can just imagine. Mama and I keep very busy with the boarding house, washing dirty sheets and skinning rabbits and boiling bear fat and lye for soap. Butte still fetches and carries for miners and rents our mule sweetheart for a dollar a day to newcomers who need help lugging their belongings upriver. Butte also works mornings sweeping out the saloon. The more mi the miners drink, the more gold dust gets dropped on the floor, so he has taken to swifting the s sifting the sweepings. We found enough last week to pay for a barrel of salted beef that was only partly rotted, and we have enjoyed it for supper ever since. Prairie takes care of Sierra and pulls weeds and is now spreading manure on what will be our vegetable patch next summer. Sierra only toddles and messes in her diapers, but we expect that for she is only two. I think we should just let Sierra sit in the vegetable patch to save labor. 
Mama found this letter before it was mailed, and that was the end of my letter writing for a while. She made me take over Prairie's job of gathering mule manure for the garden. This is how I learned that writing can be as dangerous as grizzlies if it falls into the wrong hands. Dear Graham and Grandpop, It is almost Christmas. If you would like to know what presents I would like, well, they are a book and a dress with cabbage roses, although I am not hinting, for I know you will not even get this letter by Christmas. As Christmas came closer, the boarding house was filled with whisperings, secrets, and giggles as we made presents for one another. Rose hip necklaces, corn cob dolls, taffy and molasses popcorn balls. On Christmas Eve, while darning snowshoe stockings as a present for him, I lamented over a Christmas without turkey and mince pies, eggnog and sleigh rides, grand and grand pop. Then I thought of the man with big feet crossing the pass in the snow with no kin but a dead duck. I went and hugged Mama, Prairie, Sierra, and even Butte, who grumbled but did not shove me away. Dear Graham and Grandpop, thank you for the little Christian's book of pious thoughts that you sent me for Christmas. Imagine my surprise when I opened my Christmas package and there it was. I hope you will like the pressed flower book picture I sent you. Jimmy Whiskers said the flowers are from the Manzanita tree, which does not grow in Massachusetts but thrives in California because it can spread out. I know you are right that Mama needs me there to help, but I am sorry you think me too much trouble to opt for a room to. You are not that old. Yours very truly, Lucy Whipple. And that is the end of chapter six.